Hello, working preachers. This is Ralph Jacobson. And I wanted to let you know that today is the first day of our fall fundraising campaign. All gifts made during the fall campaign will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. Give your gift today to receive on-demand access to the Craft of Preaching Conference resources. Working Preacher would not be possible without our generous donors like you. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online at workingpreacher.org today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. So here we are on the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on November 15, 2020. And the texts are Zephaniah chapter one, verse seven, and then 12 through 18. Our last semi-continuous reading is Judges four, one through seven. Psalm 90, one through eight, potentially nine through 11, and then 12. The second reading is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, and our gospel reading is Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And we should just uh, note that if you uh, did not, if you thought you didn't hear with me, Matt Skinner, you didn't hear that. Uh, that's because we had a few scheduling conflicts uh, for some of these podcasts uh, with the realities of teaching in the COVID world. And so, uh, so Matt will not be joining us uh, for this podcast, but uh, here we are, the three of us, and we are in uh, the last uh, little bit of Matthew here, Matthew 25. Uh, we had the parable of the uh, ten of the bridesmaids last week, and now the parable of the talents, which is uh, a rather challenging parable, uh, to say the least. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I read about this parable, uh, and, and it doesn't help at all. <laughs> which is not really helpful for the for the uh which not very helpful for the preachers out there but here is uh i mean the, one of the standard interpretations of this parable is what are you doing with what you're given uh are you you know are you uh are you making it uh to greater the kingdom of god or in the case of the uh, the the last servant, are you uh, burying it and uh, you know and and hiding hiding that talent in the ground? And so it's often uh, I think misused for stewardship Sunday when we equate talents with uh, gifts. And uh, when we want to remember that a talent is six thousand denarii. So that's one of the aspects of this text is that, the, the, the guy who's given five talents is given a hundred years wages. And that is, and that's part of the, I, I think that's for me, that's part of, of how to go about this parable in that the, you know, the hyperbole of how much, how much each of them is giving is part of the issue. Um, in that it's 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 so um, it's so over the top, <laughs> uh, and and so for me it's it's it comes down to verse twenty five. So I was afraid. That's where I landed this time. I was afraid. I'm not. Af I'm afraid. And what is, what is he afraid of? Uh, afraid of uh, that he would not be able to. Uh, be faithful to the master's work, didn't know what to do with it, um, afraid of displeasing the master uh, and or displays, dis, uh, fear of losing the money because it's a heck of a lot of money. Uh, and so I'm just, that's where I'm landing. Like the, that fear of what do we do with this extraordinary amount or this extraordinary gift and uh, that is just over the top of, of what we could ever possibly be given. And then where, where's the fear in that? What holds us back um, from, uh, from that faithfulness to the master's work or that faithfulness to the kingdom? Those were some of my initial thoughts uh, with regard to this parable. 
I um I think I slightly dis I mean uh, disagree with you on one thing. I find that uh, your remarks very helpful, Caroline. Um, so uh, this is this whole discourse we get in Matthew 25 and from 24 on the Mount of Olives. We said it at the end of the church year when we're thinking about the future coming of God. And that's, that's fitting in a part because uh, 25 one says the kingdom of heaven will be like, and we talked about that last week, that this is about the kingdom of God is now it's the kingdom of God will be. And so it's a parable for me is that's about living in the, already not yet of the Christian life. So, so how, how do we live in light of what we know about God and what has already been accomplished and is yet not here in its fullness? And so in that sense, um, of course, the, the way we get our word talent derives from this. You know, our word talent comes from this. It's not the opposite way around. People People won't know that, you know what I mean? So our, uh, we, we developed our sort of theology of individual gifts and talents in part shaped by this parable. Um, but I do think it's helpful to think about this. Um, I agree with you, not necessarily about stewardship, but how about how do we live? And what is this parable? What are we doing with the gifts God has given us now? They're abundant, right? Even the guy who's given one talent, that's 10 years of wages. And as a community, as a congregation, as a seminary, as a church, what are we doing with the abundant resources, the gifts God has given us now? I mean, I think to me, that's the question. Um, and where I land is that the, the, the guy who does nothing actually doesn't understand the character of God. Because here's the reason he does nothing is he doesn't understand. He says, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you do not sow and gather and you do not scatter. Actually, even if you compare that to the other parables, that's not at all the character of the God we know, who is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy. And so if we live now with a misunderstanding of the character of God, we live in fear. But if we live now with a correct understanding of the God of Israel, and the character that's been revealed in Jesus, then we can live with uh, abandon and go for it in mission for the world. All right, that's my move. I like your move. Uh, and um, I, I appreciate it that Caroline started us off on focusing on that uh, fear. Uh, how do we respond when we start from what we're most afraid of? And, and fear in, in some ways leads us to making um, incorrect judgments sometimes, um, as, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, Ralph, and significantly in this text is the mischaracterization of God. Uh, and, and you know me, I like to look at how this scene looks in the rest of, of scripture. And when I read this for the first time, I saw all over again this uh, highlighting of what I know, uh, taking taking me back to uh, the fall, what we theologically refer to as the fall, in the sense of God has provided humanity with all the resources that uh, God has are now at humanity's uh, disposal, and doubt creeps in that God is holding back. I, 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 I think I know who you are, and I'm more afraid of you, God, than I am trusting you. And when we start from that position of misunderstanding the character of God and our own, um, re the resulting fear of our, our, our limited knowledge, um, what we will do will not be to act out of the riches and abundance that we have been in, that has been entrusted to us. And uh, I, I think that, that lingering around that um, would give us a new, uh, give our listeners a new way of hearing this text. Um, I, I like to say to my students, uh, uh, instead of trying to find yourself in the text, how does this text reveal God? And, and in this particular text, it, causes us to say, what really is the character of the one we serve?
Yeah, and I, I, I think that's true. Um, I think, uh, I, you know, the other thing that I, um, I, I, that we do have to wrestle with a little bit is, uh, is that moment of judgment. Um, this is, this is, this is our, our last, one of our second to last hurrah with Matthew. Um, and there is, I, you know, I, I want us to, which we've done each and each and every, well, almost every time that we've been talking about Matthew, but that we do go back to the, um, the parable or we do go back to the Beatitudes. So what is that vision that uh, of God's kingdom that Jesus is inviting us to see? Um, and, and certainly it's in the not yet stages, right? The already and the not yet. Uh, but it's, um, but we are, we are charged with that. We are charged with a responsibility with that. And, uh, and we, uh, one of the hardest things about this parable is our, our machinations to wiggle out of that judgment. And, uh, that's, and that's why Skinner skipped probably last couple of weeks yeah. of he doesn't Matthew. Like, he doesn't He's like judgment. Chicken. He's afraid of the judgment texts. He's wiggling out, huh? Ah, now I get it. Yeah, that's probably it. But it's, uh, but you, I mean, you mentioned this, uh, uh, you mentioned this, Rolf, in, in a really important point of the location of this. Yes, it's the end of the church year. Uh, and so we're looking forward to God's, you know, the coming of, of Advent and such. But narratively, it is right before the plot to kill Jesus, where the, where the faith of the disciples will be tested. And what will they do with, with the riches of the kingdom that they have been given? And so it is a moment of, you know, I, I like to go back, I talk about this a lot with John, but I like to go back to, um, you know, the root of the root, the Greek root for judgment is crisis. It's where we get the word crisis. This is a crisis moment in that, um, and judgment doesn't necessarily have to, you know, um, not judgment to something, but uh, for something, but it's a crisis moment for the disciples. Um, and there's a lot at stake here. And I think I think that should resonate with people right now in terms of of what what are we doing to uh, to further the kingdom of God? What, what, as you said, Joy, what are we doing with what's been entrusted to us? What are our and then uh, what are our fears and what is holding us back? And so I I don't want to um, Matt might have wanted to wiggle out of the judgment, but I'm 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 not going to let us. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, it. Obviously, the, the worst thing that can happen to that Christian dialectic is that uh, the preacher or any theologian knows uh, who's saved and who's and who's judged. Exactly. And that's not what I'm saying. Uh, cool. Thank you. I'm glad about that. I, I, I know I was reinforcing what you were yeah. saying. The, um, yeah. So the, the two other, especially, right, it's well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy. And then that's a great phrase, right? That there will that be joy. Mm -hmm. But then there's also weeping. Mm -hmm. And so God's ultimate future will be the consummation that will include both joy and weeping. And in my own theology, um, that means that that I will be judged and much of me will be, un be found to be unfaithful. But even that will be forgiven because when God judges and sees me, he sees Christ in whom I have been clothed in baptism. And um, so the future, God's future breaks in. The kingdom comes now when God's future breaks into the present. And you see that, if I could make the transition to the Zephaniah text, sometimes when God's preferred future breaks into the now, it comes as moments of joy. And we like that. Sometimes when God's preferred future breaks in, it comes in moments of weeping and judgment. And that's what you see in Zephaniah. Zephaniah says, the day of the Lord is at hand. Be silent. He has prepared a sacrifice and he has consecrated his guests. Sounds like it's going to be good news, right? Not so much. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish for, uh, right, for Israel. 
in this moment. And then later we had other prophets, but um, the recognition that he will come to judge the living and the dead will mean judgment. And, and then also even breaks in now in moments of judgment. Zephaniah, yeah, that's one of those um, books that I tend to forget like Obadiah. <laughs> say like, what? Yeah, like, wait, what? That's in the Old Testament? Uh, uh, so, but um, it, Rolf, help us with this a little bit in terms of, I mean, what's, is it, is it worth it if the preacher is going to, you know, tackle this? Uh, is it worth it to do, like, is this the only time that the, that Zephaniah appears? It's like the one of wait two times or something like that. I thought you were going to ask a different question. So I'm going to ask well, the question I wish you'd asked instead. Uh, the, what's going on with Zephaniah? I thought you would ask, is this the only time that the day of the Lord is mentioned? Oh, no, I was not. Is it? No. It's, oh, it, I know. I, I know it isn't. <laughs> go ahead, Joy. Jump in. It starts off as good news. Uh -huh. It starts off as good news, but uh, I in, in uh, um, uh, help me with my zip code here. Is it? In, in um, Malachi, where we're told, you know, you think it's going to be a, a good day and it's not going to be. Um, and what you were leaning into as you were describing this, um, the way that this text opens, it looks like the consecration of the guest. It looks like this is going to be, um, if we think about, um, you know, the end of the actual year and um, we're coming up on the season of, uh, of feast and celebrations, it looks like it's a, a good thing. But at that, at that that moment, and, and I'm going to jump in here to verse 17, uh, the because, it's because they have missed the mark of who God is. And, and I think it's important for us not to, to simply let this be a sense of some people are going to uh, find joy and some people are going to find weeping. There is, the weeping is a result of stepping out of the path that God has set before us. And uh, so here in Zephaniah, it's real clear, because they have sinned against the Lord, that is why they are experiencing this, this distress. The repetition back in uh, Matthew is the two that took this, trusted the abundance of God, and used what they were given, um, they found joy. Uh, they found more abundance. The one who misjudged the character of God um, made that judgment be, that made what they were afraid of true and so they experienced the weeping um, in the very beginning um, when uh, the first um, humans lost their trust in God um, they were sent out with the same task that they had been sent they had been created for but with this uh, caveat and that is it, the work that you have been created to do is going to be difficult work to be for you to do. And, I, and that's what I'm reading here in Zephaniah, um, that um, the blood is going to be poured out like dust, their flesh like dung. Um, this, is, this is going to be devastating because we have not been faithful. And it's not that God's um, randomly doing this. But this is a response to our missing the mark on judging who God is. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, amen. The um, Just a quick, quick thing is the day of the Lord probably originally refers to the Jubilee, year of Jubilee, so people would look forward to it. And then it becomes the day when God will act on Israel's behalf to set things right. You know, uh, you know the day when our ship comes in kind of is a similar thing. Uh, and then Amos comes along first, and uh, Joel, uh, although Joel is a little more positive, uh, Amos is mostly negative, and then here we get Zephaniah. Um, I think the big connection, that's a good Bible study, if you're doing a Bible study on the text this week, uh, to do a little have a digging and trace the day of the Lord, and to, but then to think about if, if the day of the Lord is not always good news as the kingdom of God's, God's future kingdom breaks into the now, um, how is judgment something, you know, that sometimes is um, very painful, but good for us? You know, it's the refining fire, it's the testing, 
it's the uh, Caroline, it is the pruning uh, on the vine, which uh, doesn't sound like any fun if you're the thing being pruned, right? Yeah, no, I think that I think that's right. And it's, uh, yeah, I, yeah, when you say the Lord is here, or the Lord is near, that's, it's, uh, it's good news for some, but it's maybe not such good news if you like God far away. <laughs> you're like keeping God in your little box and, you know, letting God out every once in a while to play. Uh, and so, but I, I think that's helpful as we, you know, as we think about this passage and particularly in connection to Matthew is that, uh, it, yeah, it's this, it's this moment where, um, it's, it's a reevaluation, uh, a reconsideration, a, a re, you know, a reorienting, if you will, um, of what is that relationship with God like and, uh, and, and what will it look like going forward? And, and, and the, a sermon on this, on this text of the Matthew text maybe sits in that space for a little while. Uh, sits in that space of that crisis space <laughs> of 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 how are you responding to this? What does what what is going to be your response to this? I think that homiletically, that's what I would I would go for with either one of these texts. But we should go on. We have our last uh, semi continuous reading from Judges. Way to go, Deborah. So if I were going to preach on this text, I would be all over Deborah, preaching Deborah, the prophetess, judge, uh, and uh, lifting her up and her role. Uh, and also this, just this idea too of um, the role of the, the role of the prophet at this time, uh, but then also to think about um, it, to think about the ways in which uh, these, you know, these people come along, and particularly uh, Deborah, to facilitate um, and to be the voice of God in really critical times. And so, uh, yeah, I would be all over Deborah. What do we know about her? Where where she come from? Because it's not very often that we get mentions of women in these kinds of roles. I'm guessing this is the only time. Um... Deborah gets an Old Testament text, um, might be others, but, um, she, but there might be mentions of her. Um, but yeah, so in, in Caroline and in my church, this is the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in, in our tradition. And uh, my own congregation has been doing well, at least once a month this fall, uh, sermons on uh, female Bible characters in light of that. And if you haven't done anything like that, this might be your chance. Uh, to highlight both Deborah and JL, because uh, you can't forget that JL sort of nails it in this, um, in this oh. story. Oh, Ralph, I, I'm glad that you said that, but <laughs> uh, I just got to give you a throne. That was wonderful. <laughs> well, you know, I can't take, uh, it's an old joke, but I had to get it in here. The uh, I appreciate the importance though, uh, that of, of, of leaning this into JL because uh, sometimes folks forget that um, Deborah isn't the one who gets the victory here. Uh, it's a powerful line um, uh, that, that, that she is, is, is saying uh, the victory will, will come, but it won't come from your hand. And we automatically think that that's gonna be uh, a Deborah's victory and another woman is introduced, a woman who does not have the position of being a priest or a prophet. Uh, uh, she's just a lay person. If I use that term, I hate lay people using about themselves. Um, but it's a reminder that all of us have the responsibility of, uh, of demonstrating the presence and promise of God. And this text does that as short as it is. Well, it, it, uh, the sermon, of course, uh, has to tell the whole story. So you use this as introducing it. And then, and then it, is, it is also important, I think, to talk about Sisera's mother, who is the other female character uh, in the story. Uh, a reminder that not all female characters in the Bible are um, role models, because she, of course, is, um, she has, inter let's say it this way, she's internalized the patriarchy and is, a, uh, it is uh, having happy, daydreams of the evil that her son might be doing as he is actually in getting judged. Last thing about this text, uh, 
from my perspective, but go ahead and add anything is Deborah's already a prophet and judge before uh, the victory. I just want to point that out. It's not that, oh, she was this great victor, so they made her this. She was already that um, because God had made her that previously. Anything else on that? Well, so Psalm 90. Uh, I, and there's I, a quite a uh, quite a uh, very fine commentary on the website. But... Yeah, so I wrote the commentary this week, so I don't really have uh, a whole <laughs> lot to say other than I urge you to include those extra three verses because those extra, what, nine, 10, and 11 verses, that'll take you a long time to read. Um, and then actually just read it to the end, read to the end, the whole, uh, mm -hmm. of the whole Psalm. Um, as it is though, it ends uh, with this, um, if you end in verse 12, it says, teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. If you're preaching in light of the second coming, then that is part of it. It, it lines up well with Matthew 25. So, you know, how do you live now in light of knowing this is really a, this great poem on the ephemeral, you know, uh, short nature of life. And what is it like to live in light of eternity now? That's what a wise heart is. is. Yeah, I would get, I would uh, draw people to um, your, yeah, commentary. And I, I, I appreciated too, particularly um, at the end of your commentary, Rolf, where where you talk about uh, this prosper for us, the work of our hands is not just a plea, but a promise um, and a, a prayer that we could, um, that we could take with us uh, or that we could, that we could pray each and every day. And I think um, <clears throat> potentially a really powerful prayer post election, um, particularly in the, in the United States where where regardless of, of who, you know, regardless of the winner, the work is not done in terms of, of what you, what the work of the church and, 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 and how we will embody God's love in the world. And so that, that for the church to be able to say, prosper, prosper for us, the work of our hands um, and, and, really, and really believe in that promise, I think could be a, a comforting and important message right now. So then we have uh, our last reading of Thessalonians. We've been working through the um, Paul's letters to Paul's letter to first letter to the Thessalonians, and I, uh, I again, you know, this is uh, post election um, in the states, but I, I think uh, the line that I really have. Uh, centered on is verse 11 in this these last closing words of the letter therefore encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing uh we in our election day podcast if you have our post-election podcast it's one of the things that we've been we were talking about in terms of what it, what are the marks of a christian community what will people see how will how will the body of christ respond uh, to, uh, to the, you know, to the results of, of our leadership in this country. And, and that regardless of conflict and division or disagreement, we still encourage one another and we build each other up. Um, we are not about tearing each other down. Uh, and so I, I think it, you know, depending on, depending on the preacher, depending on the congregation, this might be the very message that your congregation needs to hear this week. Um, as you as you were beginning, um, I was thinking. I as I was preparing for this, I was thinking of coming in the same kind of line. The verse that stuck out stuck out for me, um, and the one that stuck out for me, Caroline, because of what you just said, is the first verse. Uh, now concerning the times and the seasons, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you know very well um, that that I think um, might be a reminder for us that uh, a lot of times in the past when I've been uh, t heard this um, text or been drawn to this text it's always been about uh, what it means for the Lord to come as a thief in the in the night and it, it's focused on that and 
it's almost as if we'd ignored that first verse that says, look, you got this. Um, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time. And yet that's exactly what we did. We spent a whole lot of time on this kind of how do, how do we know this day? And I think you're right, Caroline. And I just want to, I just want to underscore it that therefore is the most important part of this text. Encourage one another, build each other up. And I hope that that's what we're doing. <laughs>